Welcome to Inbox Roundup number seven. This week I'm going to cover the AC-130J gunship, the difference between radiological and nuclear. Could a cyber attack trigger NATO Article 5? The opinion of the Turkish defense industry and the current state of powered armor. So Sam asks, you brought up AC-130s being able to drop missiles out of the back of the plane. Could you go into further detail about the feasibility and use of this weapon system? So the modern AC-130 gunship is the AC-130J Ghost Rider. This has a 105 millimeter cannon, a 300 millimeter auto cannon, and something called the Precision Strike Package. This means that you can actually mount GPS delivered small diameter bombs on racks out on the wings or glide bombs on racks outside the wings. And this can also drop these Griffin laser guided missiles that are mounted internally on uh, some sort of rack that sits in the cargo hold on the cargo ramp and allows you to launch missiles out of the back of the plane. But the big deal about the AC-130 is actually its sensors. It has two very powerful infrared cameras that are mounted on gimbals, say outside of the aircraft. And this allows for 360 degree ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. So sometimes you want to follow your target and sometimes you want to take more kinetic options. From what I understand, the, uh, the AC-130 also has um, ECM or electronic countermeasures, and you can assume also electronic monitoring as well. So it can go up in the air, it can listen for the bad guys. If it hears the bad guys, it can spot the bad guys. And from there, we can either continue surveillance or take more kinetic options. Okay, quick note, I am traveling to Fort Campbell, Kentucky for an air assault operation with 101st Airborne Third Brigade or the Rockassans in August, and I have to pay for it out of my own pocket. So give me 60 seconds to pay the bills here. This video is sponsored by Ground News. Listen, by now you should know that I am not a political guy. Try dating in Washington, D.C., and you'll get sick of politics real quick. And I don't even have cable, so I get most of my news from my subscription to the Wall Street Journal and directly from the AP and Reuters. So, Ground News helps me identify biases inside of stories. I even have a personalized indicator that shows my bias extension. Oh, look, I'm a centrist. Imagine that. There's even a browser extension that pops up on news sites so you can see how other news organizations are covering a story. And you can use Ground News to identify the bias, distribution, and general factuality. Look, if you're like me and you really don't care about politics, you just want factual information, Ground News is an essential tool. And there's even a web app if you prefer to read the news on your phone. Compare news coverage from diverse sources from around the world on a transparent platform that's driven by data, just like me. Try Ground News today at ground.news slash Ryan Macbeth. Okay, Frump asks, you mentioned Seaburn. What is the difference between radiological and nuclear threat? So we used to call Seaburn NBC. Seaburn stands for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear. NBC stands for Nuclear, Biological, Chemical. And back in the early 2000s, the United States changed from NBC to Seaburn because we wanted to recognize the new threat of dirty bombs. And a, a dirty bomb is not a nuclear bomb. A nuclear bomb, and you can watch, my, I have a whole video on how nuclear bombs work. But a nuclear bomb has the conditions of radiation, uh, blast, and heat. A dirty bomb or a, or a radiological device is just a conventional bomb with radiological material kind of bolted on or surrounding it. And this could be radiological material that was stolen from a nuclear facility or radiological material that was stolen from a hospital or just radioactive waste. And a dirty bomb or a radiological device is not a weapon of mass destruction, it's a weapon of mass terror. And it's, I don't wanna say it's that destructive, at least compared to a nuclear bomb it isn't, because with a, with a radiological device, you are getting the conventional explosion that's pushing these radiological particles out into the environment and they'll settle on things and you have to evacuate the area. That's actually the best way of dealing with a dirty bomb. Leave the area. Time, shielding, and distance will always defeat radiation. Don't spend a lot of time in the area, create shielding between you and the radiological source, or just get away from the radiological source. 
So a dirty bomb or a radiological device is a lot easier to deal with than a nuclear device. There's certain National Guard units that actually have a specialty in seabird warfare and radiological uh, cleanup. So that's the basic difference between a nu uh, the nuclear threat and the radiological threat. Okay, Rokas from the Netherlands asks, I'm reading a lot of news that Russia is mapping European electrical and communications cables for sabotage. If Russia decides to sabotage, let's say, a windmill park owned by a country, would that trigger NATO? So we got to talk about Article 5. Essentially, NATO's Article 5 says an attack on one is an attack on all. And this is the thing that keeps the alliance together. Article 5 was created before cyber attacks were a thing. You know, the NATO was created before cyber attacks were a thing. So today, I think a cyber attack or any kind of sabotage, which would probably be done through cyber channels, I think that any kind of cyber attack could tr trigger Article 5 if it causes mass death. Uh, I know a couple of years ago, I think in France, France suffered an enormous heat wave and a lot of elderly people passed away because they didn't have air conditioning in their apartments. Because I guess in, in France, a lot of older buildings don't have air conditioning, I guess because they never needed it before. And I could see a situation like if there is a cyber attack that could be traced back to Russia during a heat wave that causes numerous deaths, that could be an issue. I could see a cyber attack that takes down some windmill farms that helps keep a hospital operating and there's deaths because, for whatever reason, the backup generator didn't kick in. I could see that happening. Um, what's interesting is cyber attacks, there, there was a promise that cyber attacks might be the future of warfare, and that really hasn't panned out. There's an excellent book called This Is How the World Ends, uh, which is essentially about the cyber arms race. And it talked about an attack, I believe, in 2020 uh, from Russia on Ukraine. And Ukraine successfully survived that attack, mainly because they had very good cyber defense and they didn't have that big of an attack service. Ukraine just wasn't as connected. Well, if you take a look at the United States of America or a lot of countries in Europe, we have one heck of an attack service. When you have your toaster and your coffee maker and your Alexa all on the internet, that, that creates a larger attack surface. So I could see, NATO countries being more at risk of cyber attack because they have a larger attack surface. And if physical deaths result from a cyber attack, I could see that triggering Article 5. Okay, next, Huey asks, how do soldiers get souvenir home like helmets, bayonets, and other such stuff? So this probably varies based on country. Uh, Great Britain might have different rules in Australia or America. Um, and from my experience, normally you need a commander's authorization. Uh, the commander has to write a letter saying, yes, I authorize this soldier to bring home this bayonet. Yes, I authorize this soldier to bring home helmets. I know during Vietnam and during World War II, soldiers could just bring home anything. You know, pistols, helmets. Uh, so uh, I think some airmen even went and bought their own personal weapons to carry uh, while in combat. So that, that, that's, that's not going to fly anymore in the U.S. Army. And actually, I know that uh, there is a guy I knew in the National Guard who, uh, in, in the American National Guard, at least it used to be this way, the National Guard used to get uh, hand-me-down equipment from the Army. So the National Guard was usually 20 years behind the Army when it came to equipment. And I know this, this one National Guard unit went over to Iraq with grease guns. Like these, I think, M3 grease guns from like World War II Korea, 45 caliber grease guns. And uh, of course, there's, they brought the equipment because it's their, it's their, it's part of their MTEL. And um, the, uh, the, when they rotated back, the Navy, the U.S. Navy actually does customs. So when you leave the country, you actually have to go through the U.S. Navy and they inspect your stuff to make sure you're not bringing home anything illegal. And the Navy saw these grease guns and they're like, you can't bring home war trophies. We need to see a letter from the commander saying war trophies are okay. And they're like, no, nah, it's actually our equipment. <laughs> they had to get the supply sergeant with the property book to come out and like, yeah, this is on our property book. So these are serial numbers. So uh, we're actually pretty strict about bringing home trophies. And also, you know, we're an army, not a band of gypsies. We're not a band of marauders or, or Vikings. 
you know, we don't go into a country to steal their stuff. We usually go into a country to restore a government or liberate the people there. We're not taking things home with us. And usually anything we do take home is going to be a military item uh, that represents a certain kind of victory. All right, next up, Sose asks, what is your opinion on the Turkish defense industry? What does the future look like? So Turkey is basically the Costco or Kirkland of weapon systems. Uh, Costco is this American hypermart uh, club where you pay a fee to join, but when you join, you get access to this warehouse full of goods. And Kirkland Signature is their is the Costco brand of merchandise. They sell everything from shirts to laundry soap to food. Uh, and Kirkland products are actually pretty darn good, uh, usually on par with national brands. So that's kind of Turkey right now. Turkey is manufacturing weapon systems that are competing with China, Russia, France, Germany, the United States. And you know, if, if you are a, a third or second world country, you might look at Russian weapons and Chinese weapons and go like, oh man, I don't, I don't know if I want to buy these Russian weapons because they aren't, haven't been working that well. And I don't know if I want to buy these Chinese weapons because God knows what kind of software flaws they put in them intentionally to turn them off if we don't pay. Uh, maybe Chinese mortars are fine, but probably not Chinese jet fighters, right? I think Pakistan's the only country that flies Chinese jet fighters. Um, and then France is kind of expensive and might not sell to us. Germany is really good, but they're expensive and they, they have certain moral qualms about selling to other nations. And the United States weapons are great and we have no moral qualms about selling to anybody, but our stuff's really expensive. But Turkey has that sweet spot between items from China and items from the United States, France, and Germany. Turkey has a lot of good engineers. One third of Turks have a higher education. One third of Turks go to college. They also have been able to do some incredible things on a defense budget of $16 billion a year. They've been able, for right or wrong, they've been able to fight the Kurds. They've been able to assist the government in Yemen. They've been able to support Azerbaijan on $16 billion a year. And I think a lot of that is due to their educated population and a defense industry that concentrates on tech. So what I can see is Turkey kind of becoming the Brazil of Europe when it comes to manufacturing because they have a highly educated population and they're making some good weapon systems for low cost. Okay, Amersfoot asks, what is the current development state of powered slash stealthy exoskeleton armor? Hmm. All right, so the problem with exoskeletons is that they need outside power. I think DARPA was working on a model and this thing took 3,600 watts of power. That's like 60 laptops of power right there. And the, the, so you can imagine how long the battery is gonna last. Uh, I don't think the battery technology is ever gonna be there to have a, a powered suit like you might see in video games or in, in those Japanese movies. The Sarkos Guardian XO, that exists and that can lift like 200 pounds uh, or I guess that's about 90 or so kilos. Um, but the problem is the batteries, the batteries and that thing have to be swapped out. Um, so that might not be a bad idea for a warehouse, but I don't really see any kind of powered suit being used in combat because you know, you're know you gonna have to carry a lot of batteries and you might be able to give yourself a big battery pack, but then how do you go prone? Or how do you squeeze through small obstacles? How do you go through a doorway? So I could see powered or exoskeletons maybe being used at a supply depot for loading trucks, something like that, with a steady source of power or a steady source of hot swappable batteries. Yeah, I, I, think, I think something like that could work, but I don't really envision any kind of, of stealthy powered suit like you might see in the movies uh, anytime soon. And uh, that's all we have for this week. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to support the channel, go over to Bunker Branding, buy a t-shirt, or head on over to Substack. Cost me five bucks. I'm definitely going to need it for this uh, upcoming trip to uh, this upcoming air assault trip to Fort Campbell. And thank you so much for watching. Hey, everyone. New Ryan Macbeth t-shirts and hoodies from Bunker Branding are available. I'm going to get the High Mars shirt. What are you going to get, Donald? The Patriot shirt, because I'm a Patriot. It's the best shirt, the biggest shirt. Make 14 tangos great again. What are you going to get, Barack? Let me be clear. 
I'm going to get a drone sweet drone shirt. What about you, George? I'm going to get a knife hand shirt because they're weapons of mass destruction. What about you, Billy? I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because my presidency always blew up in my face. I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Ronald Reagan, but you're dead. I came back to tell you that no matter our politics, we're all Americans. And we should buy Ryan's hoodies and t-shirts because they pay for the stock footage and licenses that allow him to make awesome content. So come on down to Bunker Branding and buy a Ryan Beth t-shirt or I'll start the bombing in five minutes.